Hi, my name is Professor Jennifer Nazarino, and I teach a course called Global Dynamics and Immigrant Entrepreneurship in the United States. My class has created podcasts on immigrant entrepreneurs, and you'll be listening to the challenges, successes, as well as structural conditions and contextual factors that have led immigrants to start their businesses both in in Rhode Island and around the country. Immigrants own over a quarter of newly owned established businesses, despite accounting for less than 15% of the total population here in the United States. Moreover, 45% of immigrant businesses are owned and operated by women. The students provide a deep dive and intimate look into the lives of immigrant entrepreneurs. Hope you enjoy it. So, will you begin by telling me just like the general stats of your restaurant, how many people you serve, the years you've been open? Are you talking about Big King or North? Both. Both. Yeah. All right. So North um, has been in its current location for a year and a half. It was in the location where Big King is now for mm-hmm. five years, um, so six and a half years it's been open total. Uh, it currently has between 45 and 60 seats, depending on how we end up seating communal tables. Uh, and yeah, no, it's uh, located right next to the Dean Hotel at 122 Fountain Street. Uh, Big King uh, is located in North's old location, uh, it has 21 seats opened last June, um, so June 2018, um, and that's 3 Luongo Square in Providence, Rhode Island. When and how did you decide you wanted to be a chef, and then how did you decide you wanted to be an owner? Sure. Um, so that's, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm 32 now. I took my first cook, like, professional cooking job in a in a actual paid kitchen was 15 so I've been doing it for you know 17 years at this point um, and um, you know I started doing it because uh, you know I had interest in cooking and I got a job because I like I wanted to like make some money on the side and that sort of thing and uh, I very much like fell in love with the industry and uh, and the culture and it felt very especially 15 years ago um uh, it's very. It was very different from it, from what it is today, uh, but um, it was very um, island of misfit toys kind of mm-hmm. situation. Um, a lot of uh, folks that didn't belong in a lot of other places or didn't function very well in other places could function in kitchens. And, you know, having that discipline and the uh, structure um, in certain ways was really a place where I could thrive. Um, uh, I cooked for a long time before I opened a restaurant, um, solid 10, 12 years, something like that. Um, yeah, like 10 or 11 years. I, uh, uh, I had gotten to the point, you know, I'd come to school up here and uh, I went to Johnson & Wales and for, for culinary school and um, had worked abroad a little bit and, um, and then eventually moved to New York and came back after a, a few years in New York and um, I was working for a friend uh, and he wasn't like a super close friend but um, he became one uh, Derek Wagner who owns Nick's on Broadway um, and you know I had a lot of experience at that point and like you know I was responsible for some like small menu development things here and there uh, and we had like some disagreements about a couple dishes that like I was trying to like put on the menu and um, nothing like big or whatever. It's what were you trying to put on? Uh, it was just like a pasta dish or something. Oh, yeah. you know? And like, it was like how we garnished it was like had a disagreement about it. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's his restaurant and he can put on whatever dish he wants to put on and that's absolutely his right and whatever. Um, and, but that was like a very much a clarifying moment for me that was like, okay, like I feel like at this point in my career, you know, I've been doing this for 11 years, like, I have a point of view that I want to express, and uh, the only way I'm going to really achieve that is by having my own restaurant um, to to express that. And um, and like I had some different ideas as far as like what kind of restaurant I want to run and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I was happy with Derek, and he paid me like good money, and like he was committed to a lot of like really strong principles. And I learned a lot from him, 
Uh, he still runs a very great, one of the best restaurants in the city, easily. Uh, but, you know, that wasn't my restaurant. It was his restaurant. Um, and so uh, that's when I seriously started, like, searching um, for a place to, like, build for as my own. What were his principles, and then how different were they from, like, his running uh, of restaurant principles? Like so, so, I mean, I think his principles and what he really should be applauded for in the city is that, like, he took the idea of um, sourcing uh, from Rhode Island and brought to scale. So there's mm-hmm. other guys that did it before him, um, uh, but no one did it in the way he did it. So, like, his restaurant, they're famous. They have they do dinner four nights a week, and it's very delicious, but they're famous for, like, their breakfast and lunch, and they run three services a day, um, like, four or five days a week. And um, at brunch, especially on weekends, like, they'll do, like, 300 people or 400 people. It's crazy, and they have 60 seats. Um, and so, like, no one was, like, like, committing to the scale he was. Like, so, like... We butchered our first cow together, and like butchering a, like a cow is a ton of meat. Like it, it's like you know, like a couple. It's at least like eight hundred pounds or something like that. Oh, yeah, and so it takes like a couple of people to like move it around, even when it comes in quarters. And, and you know, uh, other restaurant like we can never do that at this restaurant at Big King. We can never do that at North because it's just too much meat to process. Like we wouldn't go through it fast enough, and we don't have the storage space for it. And, you know, on top of that, it's a it's a monetary commitment. Something like that costs, you know, like $2,000 or something like that, or $3,000. So, like, um, at least, you know. So, you know, he made those commitments to that and took those risks and proved that it was, like, possible. And um, for me, that was very eye-opening because it was like, okay, like, this guy is not only just working in a small-scale, like, uh, jewel box of a restaurant, like getting in, like you know, a few fancy ducks or whatever he gets in. Like he's like committing to this idea of like sourcing from Rhode Island on a large scale, and like it doesn't just have to apply to like you know hundred dollar tasting menus or whatever. It can also apply to you know a fifteen dollar breakfast plate. Um, that was really inspirational for me, um, and that's definitely something that like I've taken with me. Um, uh, and something we've pushed, I feel like, even more forward, um, both at North and then even more so at, at Big King. Um, but, like, he is also committed to, like, his, like, you know, when I opened North, um, North was, is and was open seven days a week, seven nights a week. Um, he would, like, Derek closes two and a half days a week, um, and he only runs three or four dinner services. He runs, you know four or five lunch services and he takes those two days off like very seriously and you know at the time when I opened North I was 26 and a lot younger than I am now and um, uh, you know I came from a restaurant um, before in New York where it's like you were open seven days a week and like that's what like a neighborhood restaurant is to me um, That and there's a couple of them like Broadway Beach around here and things like that that did that but like you know that's really something I was passionate about like open seven nights a week open until midnight with our kitchen like every night Um, uh, never closing early never like whatever Uh, that was like a really huge part of like early north for us because early north was like very much dedicated or or, um, uh, focused on like servicing the service industry it was supposed to be like a cook's restaurant for cooks and uh, a place where like people would, like people in the service industry like go after work to like go get dinner because you know I worked for Derek for two years or whatever and you'd finish work at you know 11 o'clock 1 30 and there was nowhere you could go for dinner yeah you know there's nowhere for you to eat and you know I don't know if how much people understand like the restaurant business like if you haven't worked in it but like you know typically most restaurants you have like a staff meal around like three or four o'clock and then you don't eat the rest of the night until after your shift and like that you know Derek was really good about like cooking a staff meal after shift um but like 
you know, sometimes you don't want to, sometimes you just want to get out of the restaurant and, and go somewhere else and decompress, um, uh, not at work. And so there were no other options for that. And to be also to be fair, like he was the only restaurant that like I've had worked at that like did uh, at post service staff meal, like everywhere else you did it beforehand. Um, so for us, like North, when we first opened was very much like focus on the, the service industry and, and, and that's what we were um, and also like a neighborhood place you know the original location which is where we are now it's mm-hmm. surrounded by houses and, and this neighborhood is a lot different than it used to be um, uh, it's like very nice now um, it used to be a lot more rough and tumble and like uh, but it was also a lot more affordable so like a lot of the service industry lived over here and it hadn't gotten gentrified at all and like a lot of artists lived over here and a lot of like uh just a lot of families and like but like poorer families and stuff like that um it's different now and that's okay but uh it's uh you know the the area's changed um uh north has something to do with that <laughs> for better or worse you know um uh but you know it's uh you know that kind of like centered around like a residential community was something that was like really important for us in the early days and because we, we've never advertised we've never done any marketing like we never done anything like that we don't pay for that stuff we refuse to honestly um and so like word of mouth especially within the industry uh was like really important for us to start because what ended up happening is like you know uh servers would servers and cooks would get excited about the restaurant and then speak to their own customers about it and then suddenly it grew from there um, it wasn't like a there was never a master plan around it but like that's kind of how it worked out like we like focused on folks that like like we knew already and then we just built buzz and excitement within that community first and then it kind of disseminated itself into the general public after that so do you feel like the connect like the work connections you had before were a big part of that word of mouth or yeah like no, totally I mean you know Providence's restaurant community is like very connected um mm. in different levels uh so like I know all the owners of most of the restaurants in town like pretty well at this point at least of like a certain a certain caliber of restaurant um and I know fewer of the cooks these days, but that's just because I'm older. Um, mm-hmm. When I was a cook in the city, like, you knew all the other cooks and that sort of thing. Because um, you'd all go out to the same bars or mm-hmm. same whatever and, like, see each other here or there. Um, or go to each other's restaurants and, like, you'd always, like, go back to the kitchen and say hello or whatever. And, uh, and so you got to at least know their faces, even if you didn't know them personally. But we are all, like, kind of, like, poor. And most of us were living on this side of town. So, uh it was and I'm sure it's still that way in a lot of you know uh, I'm just not of that generation anymore is there any formalized like meetups or something no. or it's just like <laughs> that's who you run into no I'm just gonna check this because I'm paranoid oh yeah okay <laughs> yeah, so can you talk about like the labor and in the general hospitality industry but then versus how you think of like service labor okay yeah um well i think that it's a very complicated question (laughs) that um you know i think that the labor force um has changed a lot over the last few years so last decade um in particular Um, and that's a good thing um but it's there's a, a wave of professionalization coming through the entire industry, uh, which is important uh, and a good thing, but as with any change for people that have been in it for a long time, it can be at the very least intimidating um, and a little nerve-wracking because uh, it's a lack of stability. Um, uh, I think a lot of this had to do with a generation of cooks that are coming through the industry right now and have been coming through the industry for the last like you know eight to ten years that uh, like grew up with like a food network essentially on TV mm-hmm. um, and now I'm sure it's you know Instagram 
food videos and stuff like that. But Tasty. like, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, when I was a kid, like, uh, you know, the Food Network existed, but wasn't a big thing, and not until I was like in my early into my teenage years did it like really kind of start to blow up um and it, it's portrayal of cooks and chefs in a different light and portrayal of cooking in a different light um really shifted the gears of like what was acceptable labor I think um for a lot of families um because there's a point in time where like being a cook was not like a in some ways it's still not well I mean I think it's culturally acceptable now I think it's not as culturally valued maybe or at least um, financially valued Uh, um, but it's an acceptable thing for like your son or daughter to want to be a chef you know these days Uh, um, that wasn't the case when I started cooking Um, and I was definitely like on the cusp of things but um you know, uh, one second. Uh, we don't open until five, though. Yeah. Yeah, so we're closed right now, but. Um, and so, uh, you know, that wave of folks that have come through since then um, is pulling from a much larger group than what used to come into the industry. Because what used to come into the industry was, you know, folks that got left behind, essentially, or folks that didn't fit up in in other ways into, like, regular society in a lot of other ways. So um, if you were, like, the smartest kid in class and, like, maybe, like, college wasn't for you, Um, like, you could become a cook, you know, uh, or, uh, if, like, you went to college and, like, but college wasn't for you, or, like, you know, like, finding, like, working a corporate job wasn't your thing, um, or working an office job, or, like, other skilled labor, like, other labor, being a cook could be something that you could do, um, uh, your immigration status, like, depending on what that was, like, being a cook was something you could do, um, uh, even if you didn't have a high school degree, like, or, or a high school diploma, you could still become a cook. It's a very low level of, um, low bar of entry for it, much lower than, um, even the trades, like the trades you need to go through apprenticeships and things like that. Like, being a cook, you could just walk into a restaurant and, uh, they teach you. We make, we mean you're a good cook, but, like, you could, you know, as long as you brought a great attitude, like, you can train people. Um, and with pulling from this larger population, I think they're just higher demands um, for the industry. And there's some other factors that go into that. I mean, uh, the loss of manufacturing in this com- country uh, is a big part of it, I think. Um, so with, with that loss of manufacturing jobs, I think that the only jobs that are left in the country like that are like service jobs, essentially. Um, and so like there are demand, higher demands for like, well, if these are the only jobs we have, then like they need to be, uh, they can't be of like super low quality, you know, they can't be like super bad jobs to have. Um, and, uh, the standards need to be higher because more of us are in, are in them than ever before. Um, and then like, uh, yeah, I mean, I think those are the big things. It's like the shift of, of, who's in this labor force now than what it used to be, what is culturally acceptable anymore versus what it used to be. And then, you know, uh, has really shifted, had created this wave of, of professionalization and just, you know, and it's laughable in some ways because it's like we're not talking about, like, crazy asks here. You know, we're talking about, like, living wage, you know, health insurance, uh, some kind of vacation time, like... These are all things that, like, regular people jobs have, you know, sick pay, um, you know, like, all these things, like, are very standards across every other industry, um, but have never been standards in 
the uh, world of restaurants. And it's not necessarily because, like, owners are bad people, per se. Um, and I actually don't really blame owners almost ever. I mean, they're scumbags everywhere. But, um, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with, like, the fact that, like, the work, while still while more culturally valuable than it's ever been before, more culturally acceptable to do than it used to be, is not, um, is devalued in the sense of, like, uh, it's de- devalued financially. So, like, fiscally, like, people aren't willing to pay the money for the work. So, like, they want people to make living wages. They want people to, like, have these, like, benefits and all that sort of thing. And that's great. I agree 100%. Um, because it's important. But um, they're not willing to, like, pay the prices that are necessary in order to provide that. Because they're used to, like, paying less money. Because they're used to their hamburger or their plate of food or whatever it is being price X, where it really needs to be price X plus 15 or plus 10 or plus 5 or whatever it needs to be. Um, and, And there's a reason also why, especially today, that, like, people aren't able to commit that kind of money um you know you look at the stratification of wealth in this country as a whole um you know those manufacturing jobs are gone for a reason it's because corporations ship them overseas so that stockholders and uh you know people that own the corporations can make significantly more profit that's the only reason why they move them like, there's no other reason to do it. Um, and that gutted the middle class and has left everyone with less money. And everyone, like, or the bottom 95% of the country with less money. Uh, and they're, the money's just not there to uh, be spending on small luxuries, like going on tea. Um, and... You know, the restaurant business is doing all right, you know, in general. Uh, you know, we, in, in the sense of, like, the overall scheme of things, I think that, like, small luxuries are the things that people do splurge on these days more than anything else. Uh, but, you know, like, I can, I'm, I, I don't make much money. Like, I own two successful restaurants. Um, and because I do my best not to compromise on certain things, uh, especially in relation to, like, exploitation of workers uh, and and the land um, and, like, product and that sort of thing. Uh, or exploitation of, like, the customer base. Um, um, and that's maybe not the, the right word for it, but, like, considering what a person's average wage is, I, I feel like it's the right word. Um, it leaves with all this being kind of like a art project <laughs> more than anything else or an ego project or whatever you want to call it you know um, you know I make uh, less than all my cooks that's for certain um, I less, make less than my dishwasher um, uh, make less than all the servers for certain and, you know less than most of the part time people that work here uh, and you know and I'm and that's just because of what, where my principles are and, like, what I'm comfortable with. And it's taken me a long time to be, like, to accept, like, this is where I'm happy or at least where I'm, like, able to accept myself and accept my business. Uh, because otherwise it's a participation in, like, in things that, like, I'm not comfortable with. Um, and I think it's, like, important to understand that, like, and to have, like, you know, it's easy to be like, people need to pay more money for food, and, and that's true, but like, you know, I made, I worked for 10, my first 10 years in this industry, I made $10 an hour or less, so like, I know what that's like, I know, still don't make that much, like, I just got kicked out of my house because it's getting sold and I can't afford to buy my own house, can't afford to live in my neighborhood anymore, um, and so like, I know what it's like to like, be pinched and to like, not be able to like, splurge or not be able to like afford to like do these things so that's why we don't like you know i'm very always very hesitant about like raising our prices to the point where they really ought to be to like 
for everyone to like make a healthy profit and like whatever it's because like capitalism is what it is and um for better or worse you know depending on how you feel about that um and it's like not something i'm i am a participant in it but it's not something i'm like super comfortable like being in uh, sorry that was a long winded no, answer <laughs> Do you think that there was an experience or a person that was part of how you formed this goal to not exploit people or make sure that you're trying to do the restaurant industry differently? Um, so that's kind of a long <laughs> answer um, as well. Um, well, complicated answer. It's a bit more than a long answer because it's like, you know, we're all built from a of influences um, on herself um, and I feel like I've had a pretty like long-standing sense of what is right and wrong and like at least for myself and like what I feel is right and wrong and like the way you should treat people and what you shouldn't treat people um, and I've always been willing to take on burden in order to alleviate that burden on others um, I think that there's like a, a, a latent I'm not a religious person at all but like I think there's a, a latent sense of Buddhism in me where like you know I'm very comfortable in suffering <laughs> and the the and I think there's a, a there's in the back of my head there's a belief of uh, you know suffering that I take on is, is suffering that I'm able to alleviate out of the world and, uh, and I'm comfortable with that uh, I think that um, my first boss in New York Dave Chang um, he is like well known for being like a yeller and you know running a very hard kitchen and that kind of thing but I think people don't always give him credit um for uh, caring about cooks um, I think that he, he is the result of how he was taught so like you know I was at the receiving end of a lot of like uh, you know abuse one way or another from him but you know I don't begrudge him against it because like I especially now like I can look back at it and understand like what he was going through and that sort of thing um, and how he was taught to run things but some of the things that he did do like his restaurant was the first restaurant that like I had health insurance at and that was, health insurance was paid for which is like unheard of like even I, I don't pay for all of our employees health insurance I pay half of it that's unheard of to pay for all of it it was the first restaurant I worked at that I had vacation pay it was the first restaurant where like you know they offered like Spanish lessons so that like you know there could be better communication between like and break down some of those barriers between the different cooks um it was a restaurant where like all my overtime was paid which was crazy like that was like never a thing um a lot of things like that where it's like uh and it's it's far from a perfect organization and it's better now but still is not a perfect organization and I'm sure he would freely admit that but we definitely try to build I try to build on what he did there here um, do what he did for his staff but do it better um, um, we do that with our environment that we operate in you know as far as like how we treat each other um, it's really important to me uh, but also you know and how much we pay people and like you know benefits and all that kind of thing so can you talk about your family and that influence okay. yeah. and your grandparents immigrated was that yep can you talk about why and sure their experience um, so um i'm mixed race so uh my mother's side is polish and irish my grandfather came over, uh, you know, dirt poor, uh, was one of, like, eight children, um, but he was a teenager, like, taking care of them in America by himself, uh, and my grandmother's family on my mother's side, 
uh, fled Poland during the war, um, or World War II. Uh, they were they weren't Jewish, but they were just fleeing war in general. Um, and you know, uh, they are less of an influence on me these days. I feel like than uh, my and growing up also. My, my mother uh, died when I was young, so like. I still speak to them, but, like, we're not super, super close, um, you know, uh, we were when, like, my mother was still alive, but, uh, that changed a lot, um, my father's side of the family is Chinese, they're from Toison, which is, uh, southern China, uh, outside of Hong Kong, um, uh, my grandfather on that side, he, uh, actually went to high school in America, like, as part of a student exchange, and leveraged that, um, in the midst of, like, the Chinese Exclusion Act and everything to, like, uh, to end up staying here. He fought World War II, and, uh, that's, I think that's how he got his permanent citizenship, um, and then was able to bring my grandmother over, uh, at that point. And he traveled between Hong Kong and Chinatown, New York, and had a bunch of restaurants in Chinatown, um, where, like, he brought over to New York City a lot of, like, uh, cultural touchstones from Hong Kong. So, like, the dim sum carts, like, he brought the first dim sum carts to, like, New York City, and, like, the first, like, noodle machines, and, like, that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, that is, you know, I'm second generation, uh, which is complicated because, you know, uh, my, my father, uh, very much, like, rejected his, like, Chinese-ness, um, he doesn't, like, being it, <laughs> um, and, like, he deals with it and puts up with it, but, like, and he, like, goes through the motions, but, um, he, and he doesn't like restaurants, because he was, like, forced to work in them as a kid, as a kid, um, so, you know, it's just, like, he was very not about me getting into this industry at all, um, uh, but I always had a bit of a rebellious streak with him, and didn't like doing what he wanted me to do, <laughs> You know, what was the expectation of I like what the, he would do? The regular shit, like doctor, lawyer, <laughs> doctor, lawyer, whatever. Um, and, you know, I had, like, decent grades and stuff like that, but I just didn't have the... Like, I started working in the kitchen, and I found my home. Uh, I'm a big believer in, like, made families and, like, uh, you know, chosen homes. And, like, the kitchen was my chosen home, and, like, my coworkers were my chosen family, and for better or worse, you know. Um they're the people that I was closest with um, easily um, and who I really care the most about I mean I care about my father obviously but you know um, I'm not close with him not in the way that I'm close with you know my wife's a different story but like you know I'm very close to my wife obviously but um, uh, compared to like even some of my employees here or, or at North some of the guys that have been with me for a long time um, you know those are the guys who and women who, like, really know me well. Um, and that was important for me. You know. Was the restaurant industry the only industry that was open for your grandfather, or was... Uh, no, they had a laundromat, too. So, you know, oh, all okay. the cliches. Um, laundromat, restaurant, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Chinese laundry, Chinese restaurant. Uh, but, yeah, that's, like, really where they focused. Yeah. I mean, uh, our family doesn't really talk about their history at all. So, like, we don't really... Know, we, like, know snippets of stories and things like that. But, like, you know, we don't really talk about it. Um, it's just a, a thing. I don't know. Like, even, like, uh, it's a weird... I don't know if it's because my father and, like, his, like... Um, his, like, non-desire to, like, know about any of it. Um, or it's not his non-desire to know about it. He had a deep desire to be an American, which is really what it was about. You know, like, deep, deep desire to be American. Um, and to, like, fit in and that sort of thing. And he did really well for himself. He, like, he's an office worker, like, works on contracts and does inventories and office jobs and stuff like that. And he makes good money doing it, like, for, you know, big companies. But, and that, he, I'm very grateful for him because I had a, you know, a, a, all things considered, like, a pretty, like, a very stable childhood, you know, the death of my mother notwithstanding like uh you know i grew up in a suburb in new jersey and like was not want for anything per se you know we didn't have 
an extravagant life at all, but like I got to go to space camp, that was cool, you know, things like that. Um, uh, and you know, uh, that was that afforded me a lot of like luxury of figuring things out, um, and so so I'm very appreciative of that. But his path is not my path. What would you say your concept of home is? Like, is it Rhode Island? Is it New Jersey? Oh, it's definitely like Rhode Island now. New Jersey is not home for me at, at, at all. Um, New York might, I would maybe consider home, but every year it becomes less and less so. Um, you know, I don't know if I'm going to stay in Rhode Island forever, but like, um, you know, for me, home is, you know, being with my wife and kid. Like, that's like literally all that matters to me. Um, uh, I have a very strong connection to Rhode Island. I really love it here, and it's really beautiful, and we've developed a lot of deep bonds with our farmers and fishermen and all that sort of thing over the years, and the community of Providence that have been supporting us for six, seven years at this point. But, um, I think e even Providence itself, like, it's a very dynamic town, and there's always people coming and going, a large part of that's the, the student population, and you know, you get to know some folks, and then they finish college, and they move on to another city, and that's cool. Like, I'm, like, glad for them, and some of them come back, but most of them don't, and you kind of get used to that in some ways. There's not a lot of, like, there's a much smaller group of people that, like, are, like, dedicated to staying in town, um, or come back, or whatever. I mean, and I don't begrudge anyone for leaving, because I left, you know, um, and then came back, uh, you know, so my wife grew up in Rhode Island, and she, like, to Boston for college, and, like, you know, it's, it's all, I don't hold any, like, I don't hold that against anybody, I don't think it's a bad thing, it's a good thing, um, I think that there's a lot, there's a lot to appreciate in Rhode Island, though, um, and I think it's tough for college students to, like, really understand that and grasp at it, because, you know, you get stuck in, like, the microcosm of a world that's built for you, essentially, you know, especially, um, you know, I was about to say, especially, you know, Brown and RISD students, but it's even JWU students, just in different ways, you know. Brown and RISD students, it's obvious because you have Thayer Street and East Side in general. Like, that's Thayer Street in particular. It's, like, built for college students. And yeah, like, how do you feel about Shake Shack? It's, it's <laughs> fine, you know. Like, it's, it's, like, not a bad company, and, like, it, it is what it is. Like, they're not really a competitor of ours, so it's, like, and even if they were, like, it's not a bad thing. Like, um... You know, I, I, I was there when Shake Shack first opened in, you know, 2007, 2008 in New York, and, like, I loved it. Still love it. Like, I think, don't think it's a bad thing. Um, uh, but, you know, it's just, um, it's interesting. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting, like, that, you know, e e I, even my experience at Johnson Wales, like, which is a much less, like, you know, they encourage people to live off campus, things like that, you know, where, um, I still didn't understand Rhode Island when I was in school, because I was in college, and I was living a college-style lifestyle of going to parties, and going to class, and, like, focused on that little world, and I worked, but, like, you know, I was working at, uh, whatever restaurant, and, uh, didn't really get out of town, or, or even really outside of, like, my designated areas of, like, where I went to school or worked or lived, you know, didn't really explore at all, because I was busy with other, focusing on other things. Um, when you get out of college, there's, there's no more parties to go to, <laughs> um, or at least not in the same, not, not the same ones, um, and, you know, for, when I came back, that was a big thing for me, it was like, oh, like, you know, a majority of our friends had moved away, we had a couple that still were here, and, like, we started, like, getting at it. like we had cars and stuff like that and I was like oh let's go down and go down to the beach and like walk around down there or let's go to this like forest or like let's go like take a canoe on this river or like whatever you know like or like let's go to different parts of the city that like we hadn't really visited at all and like start to explore like oh yeah there's like a Cambodian restaurant and it's really good or like hey there's like this huge Guatemalan population here and like let's go to this Guatemalan restaurant, like, you know, and, like, all these things that, like, I didn't see as a student, um, because, like, my attention was drawn and forced 
for better or worse. It's not, I'm not, I'm, it's not a bad thing that I was uh, to like these certain things. Uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, like I, I have a strong connection to Rhode Island, but, you know, for me, home is, is as cliche it is, like, as cliche as it is, it's, it's where my family is. Um, and they're, they're the most important thing to me, more than anything else. And then you described your restaurants as Rhode Island restaurants? They are, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's based on, like, the, the thought process of, like, you know, if all the ingredients are from Rhode Island, or, like, 90% of the ingredients or 80% of the ingredients are from Rhode Island, and, like, all the proteins, does it really matter, like, what lens you frame it from? Like, is that not Rhode Island food? It's not traditional Rhode Island food, by any means, but it is Rhode Island food. So, like, here at Big King, like, every piece of produce that we serve comes from Rhode Island. It's grown by a farmer in Rhode Island that we know. Every piece of meat, like, or poultry or whatever it is, like, it's raised by a farmer in Rhode Island that we know. All the fish that we get, like, or 95% of the fish we get lands in Rhode Island at Point Judith. And we know the fishermen, or we know, like, our, we have our fish guys down there. And so, like, if all those ingredients are from Rhode Island, then who is to say that this is not Rhode Island food, no matter how we choose to cook it? So if uh, someone said, oh, your restaurant's Asian fusion, would you push back on that? <laughs> I mean, no. Like, I mean, whatever. Like, people are going to label the food wherever they want to label it, you know. Um, they, they all... People need to put, put their own frame of reference on things. But, like, I'm never going to claim... Like, this is, like definitely a Japanese, we are definitely influenced by the Japanese aesthetics of this restaurant, but, like, we're not a Japanese restaurant. There's no one that's Japanese that works here. Um, you know, we have some thought processes on flavors and things like that, like, that go through that ringer, and, um, and there's a lens of, like, how we treat product here. Um, but that has, that's with, like, less about, like, authenticity and, like, what Japanese food is. Um, and more about like how do they treat the product in their own country and like what can we pull from their process that like can be that we can then treat our product like so you know if they're like I say that like north is like spiritually Chinese because the service style there is Chinese one, you're eating everything with chopsticks. Everything's meant to be shared. It's all communal. Um, you get multiple dishes at a time. Um, uh, like, even, like, the ser- like the service itself, like, servers, like, we're not there to, like, wait on you hand and foot. We're here to get you your food as quickly as possible. And, we, you know, do what we can to, like, be nice to everybody and, like, make sure that, like, everything goes out nicely and, you know, people are taken care of. But, and the food and the wine list and everything else is like you know not always Chinese influenced um but like at its heart like it's saying like all right as a person that grew up eating in Chinese restaurants like and whose family owned Chinese restaurants this is how I remember the food being served this is how I remember like uh the dishes being designed. This is how I remember, like, the flavor combinations coming together. Um, and the textures coming together. And, like, the acidity. And it's not, and it's very general. So it's not about, it's not about, like, soy sauce. Or it's not about, like, you know, a particular, like, kind of, you know, chili. Or, or a particular kind of, you know, a specific pep preparation. But it's like, how did that dish make me feel? And then why was that, do- like, why was that dish delicious? Like, the wh- the whys behind it were really key for us. So it's like, you know, this dish at North, or this dish that I had growing up was delicious because it hit these certain sweet, sour, savory notes, and then also had this, like, texture to it, and had this balance within it that kept things interesting, um, and always kind of changing. And then how do we apply that to Rhode Island ingredients? And it's the same thing with this restaurant, Big King. Like, it is, some would say it's a Japanese restaurant. Um, And it's a reflection of the small amount of time I've spent in Japan 
and the large amount of eating I did while I was there, um, you know, of how you think about a particular ingredient and then how you treat that ingredient. So, um, you know, uh, how, whereas like North is a little more extroverted and about creating a, a mixture of different ingredients to achieve a balanced whole. Um, at Big King, um, it's about kind of focusing on singular ingredients and showcasing that. Uh, and in the same way, like, allowing both its beauty and its flaws to, like, really exist and be what they are themselves. Uh, which is you know, definitely something that we pull from Japanese aesthetics and in some ways Korean aesthetics, but uh, more well known to, to be Japanese aesthetics um, and Japanese food in general. Uh, you know, it's not, we're not here making, you know, we're not claiming to like have like super authentic Japanese food here um, because frankly, I don't think you can really have that outside of Japan um, or maybe like California where like there's it's that much closer um, and there's much more common ingredients um, you know out, out here it's like you know for us it's like if we're doing our best job we're thinking about the ingredients in the same way uh, that someone who owns and runs a Japanese restaurant would or cooks a lot of Japanese food would and a particular kind of Japanese restaurant, obviously. And then it's also a reflection of our own experiences through it. So it's all uh, there's no like there's no clear cut answers to that. Okay. How much time we got? Okay. <laughs> um, so can you talk about the resources that allowed you to start two restaurants, like sure. social, economic? Yeah. <laughs> um, well. Uh, the second restaurant and everything subsequently that I've had has been built off North, the Bridge on North. We opened North with $35,000. Um, we paid $30,000 in key money and then had five grand in the bank, bought a little bit of equipment, and basically existed for the first two weeks by selling leftover booze that was in the restaurant. And we, had a, we opened with a menu of like three items. We had like a lobster roll, a squash salad, and we eat, like, carved country ham. Um, country ham was, like, already in my house. The lobster roll, like, we had, we went down to the docks to, like, pick up some oysters. We did oysters, too. And, like, uh, there's a guy on a lobster boat pulling up, and we happened to get some cheap lobsters off of him. And uh, the squash salad was because I felt like I needed something, the vegetables in there. And that's all we did for the first, like, three nights was that was the entire menu. Um... And then selling, like, old bottles of wine that were still here from the last restaurant that was here for, like, $8 and, like, buckets of beer for, like, 12 bucks or something like that. Um, and then opening it with friends, um, which is a good and bad thing, you know. Um, and But, like, they were willing to put in the work, and so was I. And, you know, we got... We worked really hard and got really lucky, honestly. And everything after that has been built on that. So, like... We've never had any bank loans because banks would never talk to us. Um, you know, we've had a couple. Like, so the first restaurant was financed by the previous owner. We basically bought it from him, and he held on to paper for us. So, like, we overpaid for the space, but at the same time, like, he was a bank that, you know, when no, when no bank would talk to us. Um, and there are some, like, messed up terms of that agreement that, like, it wasn't a bad thing for him. Uh, but, uh, and then we moved to the Dean, like the Dean, like loaned us money for, to buy that restaurant out, things like that. So it was really just like building itself on top of each other. Um, and like having a proven track record of, even if we never made a ton of money of being like a well-respected restaurant that could like you know, exist, essentially, you know. Okay, final question. Sure. 
So how do you think about the platform that you have as a successful chef owner? Mm. And then tell me about what you're thinking about going forward. <laughs> sure. Um, I don't know. I think that uh, yeah, the platform is broader and more limited in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, I... I'm surprised by the response we get sometimes about stuff um, and when people are listening uh, but at the same time like you know we're just a small restaurant in the grand scheme of things or a small couple of restaurants in the grand scheme of things um, I think that they're I, I've become less and I'm continually less and less comfortable with like the industry as as it stands right now and while we try to do everything right and make the correct decisions um, at least for us that keep us comfortable keep me comfortable um, it doesn't do a lot to address the broader more systemic issues uh, that are the root cause of of a lot of the problems. I mean, I think the, the issues in our society reflect in the restaurant industry um, very obviously. You know, uh, the wealth gap is the, the biggest thing that comes to mind. And it's very difficult for a restaurant or individual restaurant or even an industry as a whole to like try to address that. Um, it needs to be like a nationwide addressing of an issue um, because you know even if like if I raise my if I raise my workers wages to $15 an hour tomorrow uh, or higher um, I would have to raise the prices to reflect that which is fair um, but um, you know at the end of the day like that's going to lead that's like what's really scary because you know it can lead to a lot of you know suddenly you get the reputation of being an expensive restaurant and the people that could come two or three times a week suddenly are coming once every two weeks or something along those lines I mean, it's a drop in business and you're scaring other people away that like aren't willing to take the risk on a you know 20 something dollar dish versus you know a 10 15 dollar dish and, you know, he, you hear folks and it's like, well, then, like, the restaurant industry just, like, needs to, like, as an industry, like, raise their wages as a whole. That's fine, too, but, you know, that, that's only one industry. And then and I think that, like, would hurt the industry as a whole, and you're always going to have people that are going to break away from that or find loopholes or whatever they need to do. And then it's like, oh, well, we could really fight for, like, Fifteen dollar wage, like nationwide or, or statewide or whatever, and I agree with that. But I think it also needs to be tied with like it needs to be tied in some way to like addressing the root issue, which is like that money has to come from somewhere, and that money coming from other middle class workers, you know is going to be part of the solution but like the real solution is trying to like equalize the or sh uh, shrunk, shrink the, the wealth gap between the super rich of this country and everybody else because like they're the ones that got like extra wealthy from shipping our jobs overseas and unless that gap is addressed um Yes, the government can print money out of nowhere, but at the same time, like, I don't know if there's, like, a really good other way of doing it. Like, like, you can only do that for so long, and I don't know if that, like, addresses the core issue, which is income disparities um, between, you know, the wealthy in this country and everybody else. Um, and so whether that's a $15 minimum wage, with, which I think is really part of it, but also, like, talk about other things like you know housing issues and uh subsidizing and, and like i don't know like 
subsidizing renters in any way. So, like, we subsidize every mortgage in this country uh, through the tax code. But, like, subsidized housing is, like, considered welfare. And, like, and is a evil or bad thing. Where, whereas every baby boomer that owns a house is getting a subsidy through, their, through the tax code for on their house. Um, things like that, you know, that really can uh, get at the roots of, of some of the issues. Because, like, not everybody owns stock. Most people don't own stock. Most people don't own land. Most people don't own buildings or houses or whatever. I don't own any of that. I own a business. And I'm considered, like, you know, bougie for that but like and the reality is, is like my business isn't worth anything you know it, when like if I close north or close Big King like my business is worth a bunch of like used shitty r- restaurant equipment that has almost no value so um, you know it's the landowners it's the the super wealthy it's the building owners like the landlords like and there are like not every landlord's like rich but like it's at the same time like those are the people that like stand to benefit the most in our current like system and have been benefiting for you know decades and the rest of us are kind of just left out um, you know so that's really where I think like we need to like focus and really need to address those issues if we we you know, other th- small things we can do in the meantime are definitely, like, stopgap measures that can improve the lives of, you know, workers across this country and across our state and across our city. But at some point, like, that's a problem that, like, we need to, like, really... It's a hard problem because, you know, they're the ones that have the money. They can spend it on, you know, politics and everything else. Uh, and no one likes the idea of, like, having their own money stripped away from you. But... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. They've been doing it for years to us. So, uh, I don't know. That makes me a weird lefty progressive or whatever you want to call me. But, um, uh, yeah, that's all I got. Great. <laughs> all right. Okay. Then would you just say your name and introduce yourself? Sure. Like, Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, James Mark. I own uh, North and Big King Restaurant.